Hi, welcome to Go on the Run, and this is part one of Resource Pool. So what is a resource pool? Well, let me put resource pool to the side and talk about two other pools you might have come across. One of them is a connection pool, the other is a thread pool. So let me start with a connection pool. So when you use a database, something like MySQL Server, for example, your application, the client, will need to often connect to that database. And instead of, let's say, when it makes a connection, the connection is expensive. And so what you want is the application to make a connection. And if it's no longer being used, to get rid of it. And the reason why is because the resources tied to that, if the application just keep allocating and many other parts of the application just keep creating connections to the database and never release them, then you'll use up memory. Not to mention from the database side, it's going to see all these connections coming to it. So and not all of them might be used to be sending requests. So what you tend to have on your client application is something called a connection pool which is basically a set of connections that are going to be managed as one. And when a part of the application wants to make a connection to the database, instead of that application making an explicit connection to the database, it goes to the pool and it requests an, a, a connection. And then if the pool has one available, it will give it to the part of the application that needs it, and the application can use it. When the application, the part of the application is finished with the connection, you know, making a query to the database, it returns it to the pool. Now, why is this better than each part of the application just trying to establish a connection to the database and tearing it down? Well, even if you are really good at doing that, the whole setup and tear down might be taking a lot of time. And so now, even though you're really good at not keeping resources around longer than they're needed, you're really spending a lot of time configuring that connection and then tearing it down. By having a, putting the connections in, within a pool, the pool can set up a few um, connections, that might take it some time too, but because when the parts of the application request one, there's a good chance that the pool, the connection has already been set up, so it simply just takes it and sends it request over to the database and get a response back, and then since it's considered itself finished for now, it can tell the pool, you know what, I'm finished with this connection, hold on to it. it the pool can make intelligent decisions about how many connections it wants to keep active to that database. Now, from the database server point of view, there might be a number of connections that are active, but instead of having, you know, 100 connections active, maybe it might just have 10 or 20. And that's better in terms of number of resources on both the client side and the database side. So that is one way in which you might have come into contact with pools, and that is a connection pool. Another type of pool is a thread pool. So if you come from a language like Java, for example, you might use the executor. And basically what it is, is a thread pool that you can create and you can give it the implementation of a thread. And then you can ask this pool for a thread to run that implementation. The nice thing about thread pools is that they, they work nicely with futures, which is when something takes a long time and then you get the result after you recall it. So asynchronous type of work. So those two examples shows that how uh, um, places where you might want to use a pool to manage resources because um, it makes a more efficient use of your resources to be able to manage them as a set as opposed to each part when they need a thread or need a connection have to manage that. Now, why would we do a resource pool in any language? You can use a resource pool in C, C++, or even a language like Java where you have garbage collection. And I'm going to show you that a resource pool even makes sense in Go also where there's a garbage collector. And the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to start out by writing a client and server application. And in part one, we'll develop the client. Part two, we'll develop the server. We'll test it and we'll show that without a resource pool, we'll see that all the garbage collector run frequently to allocate and or to clean up um, resources. And by using a thread pool, we can ha have the garbage collector do less work. And that is a good thing. Just imagine you have a garbage collected language, and yet your application is able to run in a way in which you, you don't call the garbage collector often, or 
the garbage collector doesn't have to run frequently in order to clean up resources. And the way we're going to do this is taking that example again of the connection pool. Imagine that, oh, um, we have a server and clients connect, make requests for the server. They send in some sort of message and the server needs to allocate some memory to represent that request so it can send it off to some go routine to do some work on it. And then after the go routine completes and, you know, serve that client, the go routine either goes away, but certainly the resources that was allocated to represent that request goes away. We're not going to worry so much about whether the go routine goes away or not. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking here about the resources allocated, the memory allocated to represent that request. And if you could imagine that we might have hundreds or thousands of clients connected and then they send requests at different rates and so on, we can easily have tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of objects that we need to manage over a period of time. Here is the tricky part. Now, because, or let's say our request from a client is something that's very short-lived. Client submit a request, the server operates on it, responds to the client, and like I said, after you finish with that client's request, that object representing that request goes away. Now, the client might send another request, and the server has to get another object to represent that request, but each request in itself is very short-lived, and that's typically the case with, um, RESTful application is you send a request in to post something, create something, look up something, it comes in, the server does it, and then return it. No, of course, there's some requests that take a long time. But for the most part, in your web server, you want to make sure that those requests don't take a long time. Because if the user is sitting on the other end of those requests, the user is going to perceive things that take a long time as being sluggish. So that's why we're saying that all these requests are very short-lived, but you can have thousands of them. So enough talking, let me jump into the code. Let's look at the client side. The client side, we want to have a client that submit a few thousand requests to our server. So let's develop that client. So where I am in my project directory, it's um, resource pool. I have part one and two and three, but don't worry about that. Let's focus on part one. And I'm gonna start up my Visual Studio Code editor in this directory, I already done that. And so I have a few exercises for us to go through to try and make this easy for us to build up without me um, having to type it live. And so the first thing I want to do in my exercise one directory is to make importing and so on easy, I create a module in this directory and you don't have to worry too much about it, you just give it any name. And so one way is to simply create a file called go mod and you know, I call this thread pool. You can do it from the command line also. So for example, um, one way is to use the, so let's say if I delete this module file, I can simply say, let's go to part one and then exercise one. And I can say go mod in it. And then I can say tread pool. And that's going to create that file for me. And notice it just have this to say that oh, I'm using Go version 1.2. Now, another way of creating a module, if you haven't seen my video on Go modules, definitely take a look. And so I can just click here on this directory and I can create the file myself, go.mod, and then module thread pool. And then that's it. And I have the Go language plugin for my Visual Studio Code editor. And at some point, it's going to stick Go version 1.12 in there for me. But I need not worry about that right now. Um, but that's the first thing we're going to do. The next thing we're going to do in this directory is create a subdirectory called model. What is model? Model is going to be the description or representation of the objects that we send between client and server. So for now, I just want to focus on the object we're going to use to send to the server. For that, I have a simple struct called client request, and it has an ID, and we're gonna pretend that our client sends several requests to the server and needs to keep track of those ID. Maybe the, uh, the requests are sent in order, but maybe the server respond out of order because the server might take a long time to process the first request, and maybe the second request is shorter, and so the client needs to keep track of which request um, it's getting the response for. So let's pretend so the, the, the client 
is going to be the one ordering and said, this is my request one, this is my request two, and the server responds, you know, in some fashion with which request it's responding to. And the client needs to, we will say the contract here is the client would say what type of work it needs to perform and whether this is a request to do some addition, figure out the average or something, um, get some random data or some random numbers. Maybe it's to do spell check on the server because spell checking is so expensive on our device that we don't want to do spell checking on the device. We don't have a dictionary, for example. A dictionary, the dictionary would be too big for us to hold on the device. And so we have a server where we have these hundreds of thousands of um, words and we'll do spell checking on the server. So when we want to spell check, we'll just send a word after the user's requested to be spell checked. And we'll say, okay, we'll spell check this for me and come back either with some suggestion or if this is an error or what. And then maybe I want to do a search. So maybe I just send a search string and to look up some stuff on the server and Maybe if the user, if I'm managing files on behalf of the user, like they want to see a set of files that match a certain string. And so these are some of the requests or operations I can send. And so that would be um, described here. Now, if you don't know what this means, it's basically a identifier that comes in a Go language. It's an identifier, not a keyword, identifier, pretty clear identifier. You could see it says cons zero. Now what the Go compiler does, is it start with zero as the first value and then it increments these values. So this is going to be zero, one, two, three, four, etc. And this is nice because if I rearrange these, it's going to correctly um, rearrange them and reassign the values. And so that's sort of a little bit better than if I had to, you know, give them numbers myself. This comes in really nice when it comes to time, like let's say I want to insert a new value in between here, I won't have to worry about rearranging the entire list. And so if this is confusing to you, you should definitely, or before you use it, you should definitely check out the Go language documentation because um, this operates in a certain way that if you have individual constants, instead of putting them in this group, um, each one resets also. So definitely make sure that you read up the Go language documentation on how to use IOTA. All right, so those are my types of requests I can send. Now for my request data, I have a fixed size array, and this array from in this example is just 1K, and that's the max. Some of my requests might be the data I'm going to send is going to be less than this max size. So for that reason, I want to specify how many bytes of data this request contains. So this is what a request object look like when it goes from the client to the server. Now, if you haven't seen my video about encoding and decoding in JSON, do check it out. So let's start implementing the client the client application now, now that we have a model that the client and the server can use. So for this, we want to write a piece of code that's just going to encode and send things over the wire. So let's take a look at exercise two. In exercise two, I still have my go mod file. I have my, my module file. I have my client the model I'm going to use between client and server, and this is a client request. Now we can imagine that how the server will respond. So we can have a, you know, response object, whether you want to call it the client response or just simply response, you know, up to you. But I decided not to focus on that because I'm going to be focus, focusing on how the server behave in terms of allocating all these requests. The reason I'm not focusing on the client is because we have many clients. So it doesn't sort of matter like what they're doing. It's a server that we want to optimize. Okay. All right. So let's look at our client. And in our client, I have this submitter.go um, file. And let's start with this function. So before that, let's say we have a client. And our client are going to send a certain number of messages. And Let's just say that if I run this client, I want it to send 10,000 messages. So how should I do that? Well, if I, my, if I start up my client, it hasn't sent any message yet. So the number of messages left to send is really the maximum number of messages. That's how many it hasn't sent. It has to send, so there's how many are left. So I initialize message left to be the total number of messages that I should send. Now, let me take away some of this code and show you what's going on. So let's simplify things a bit. Let's say this is what I have. 
So I sit in this loop and I say, so long as I have message left to send, I'll go allocate a new message. This is the same as if I call new model that client request. Okay, so I'm creating a new client request object and we can see that our I've imported that here. Notice for my import statement, because I have a module, it's very easy. I can say in re reference to the relationship to the module, I want to pull in the model package. And so that makes it very, very easy. And so I get a new client request object. I want to keep track of each one of my requests. So I start my request ID. If you remember from our model, we have that each request each client request is going to have a ID. So I just increment my ID and assign that. Then the request type. Well, we can use any one of um, the, sorry, this is a bug. So request size, we are going to use a upper limit of the request size. So if I go back and I take a look at this, for my request object, like I said, we're doing one kilobyte for uh, possible request size. So by calling um, random number int n, as you can see, it int n returns as an integer a non-negative pseudo random number between zero and you know n less than or equals to zero. So we now have a value that we know is going to vary for each request and so this is a nice way of doing that now what is r r is the random number generator that we created here and we initialize our random number generator source with the current time okay so this is still a bug because each time we go wrong in this example we need to subtract you know one or decrement this value so as this is right now this is not going to work because I need to adjust this to be zero. Okay, so let me go undo some of the changes that I had before and put back the code that I had. I'll be sure to fix um, my the bug here. The bug here is that this should be size. This is the size of our data that we're sending. I am not so interested in the type because I'm not doing anything with the type on the server. It's just for illustration purpose, we're assuming but I sort of want to show that a very amount of data. So I sort of populate that field. Okay, so I'm sitting in a loop and for each request, I print it out to the screen, just, just for us to see for now. And what you see here is batch. Now remember, before I had, when I had removed this for a loop, we'll just try and send the messages as quickly as possible. But I want to pretend to be like a real client. And so clients generally don't connect and just send a bunch of requests. What happened is they're sort of like, you know, one, two, then 20, and then sort of things like that, right? So what I'll do is so long as I have messages left to send, I want to figure out how many messages I should send per batch. And so I'll sit in the loop and do things per batch. And so what is my batch size? If I hold this over here, it's batch size is defined the number of messages by 10, which is 10%. And then multiply by two. So that give us 20%. So our batch size is 20%. And because I'm capping that with a pseudo random number between zero and batch size, now we, we can see that our, my batch size is not always going to be the max batch size, but it's going to be some number between there. So I'm really capping it to 20%. So between zero and 20% of the maximum, the, all the messages that we can possibly send. Now, here's the thing. Once I figure out how many messages I'll send in this batch, I need to adjust my number of messages I have left. So that makes sense. Before I wasn't doing this, if you remember when I took this out. So if my batch size come out to be 20, then I have 20 less messages to send if I do send this number. And the only other thing I have to take care of is the situation in which if I send certain messages, certain amount of messages, and I go wrong and I come back, Let's say I have five messages left, let's say to send. And because my batch side is 20% of the total, which in this case would be 2000 and some random number between zero and 2000. 
well, it's possible that I could come up with a number that's greater than my how many messages I have left. Now, it's not the end of the world. It just simply means that we would have sent more messages than our 10,000. So what we have to check and see is if the batch size is ever more than how many messages we have left, then we simply send how many messages we have left. That's the only caveat. Now, you could use the min, a min function to figure this out, and I always do min of messages left, comma, min of batch size. But I think there's no need to write another function, so that's why I do it right here. If this is confusing to you, let me know. I'll try and explain it, but I think it's sort of straightforward. Okay, so now that we have adjusted how many messages we'll send in this batch, we just go into a for loop and send the messages. If you remember, this is what we were doing before. We just send in the messages. Right now, we're not actually sending to a server. We'll do that in the next part of this exercise. Okay, so because I said before that clients usually don't connect and send all their messages, they're sort of bursty, right? And so for that, when we set up a certain batch, when we set a batch of messages or a request to the server, we'll sleep a little bit. Now, if I had coded this to be some random number again between you know, 0 and 200 milliseconds, you could make it any number you want, um, but um, I didn't want it to be evenly spaced out again. If you were looking at this, clients don't usually just go to sleep for 200 milliseconds, wake up, send some a batch of messages. So we have two variables here, how frequently the batches come and how many messages are in a batch. So that makes it sort of look a little bit more realistic. Now, this is just the implementation of one client. So we have to run multiple of these clients in order to sort of really see any sort of anything interesting on our server. All right. So if we go to our exercise two directory, uh, so I go to client to mod module model and let's do go build and that builds successfully. Go back up and go into our client and let's do go build. Uh, go build. All right. So I don't think I had to go build a client actually. I think I wasn't in the right directory just now. Yes. So now we have our client, we can run it. And so you can see, um, this is gonna go by 10,000 messages. I'll stop it here. And if we scroll up a little bit, you will see this is a message 6,400 and something. And we should see a number at the end that tells us how many bytes was in the message. So that's the size. And if we scroll back, we can see this message was 407 bytes. Now we could keep going back. This one was 929 bytes because we have what 1000 bytes per message. And this is always going to be a thousand bytes because we're using an array, but what we're sending in our messages, how many bytes in this array can you use essentially? That's what, that's what, that is what we're saying. And so we're not initializing it right now, though we could. So let's look at example three. And here we are. We haven't changed anything else. What we've done is we've added a main.go. So what is the purpose of main.go? Main.go is going to, by default, try to connect on a local port 8080. And so we use the flex package to say that we have this option called minus s to specify a server host port in this format. And our default, if you don't specify anything, is to connect to the local host. Otherwise, you can override it to point to some other remote server and colon port. And we parse our parameter and then we call this submit request function. Submit request function is the function that we wrote before except we change the name from main to simply say submit request with a URL. The only part that change is here. Before, after we initialize our, and then there's that bug again, this is size. After we initialize our request, we create a new request and initialize it. We used to just print it out to the screen. Now, what we want to do is call this function called encode request. So take our request and encode it into JSON. Do a JSON encode. Now, you don't see that from this, but that's what we're going to do. That's what we said we we're going to do is turn our request into a JSON object and then send that to our server. Once I have this as a JSON 
object. Now I can use the HTTP host function, which says submit this to some URL, the content type and the body, which is a IO reader, which you can read the data. And so that's why our buffer here, our encode request function actually return an IO reader because we can take that IO reader result and pass it directly to our post function. And so that's what we do. So very, very simple. Post returns a response and an error. Since it returns an error, we can check if there's no error, then we should, if you look at the documentation or you read up the documentation for this, it says that the caller should close response that body when done reading. We're not interested in reading the data. So we just immediately do, we could have called response that close immediately, but I do it before so you can do it at the end of this function, just in case later we want to slip in, you know, something that says read the body or the response back from the server. Okay, so that's all we, that's basically the new code that we snuck in here from our previous example. So now let's look at what in code requests look like. Very short function. And the only reason I didn't put this code literally in place here is because I wanted to make it sort of easier to read. And so in code request takes the new request, returns a, an object that implements the IO reader interface. For us, it simply means creating a buffer, a bytes buffer, and bytes buffer implements both IO reader and IO writer. So I can pass it here as an IO writer to the new encoder. And when I say encode some data and give it this variable, which is our request, that gets encoded and written to my bytes buffer. When I return my bytes buffer, I'm returning it as an IO reader and hence I can send it to post. Now assuming all of this work, we should be able to, let me uncomment this, and we should see JSON encoded data when we write it out to the screen. So let's run this. Oh, we have to go to, go up one, go to our example three directory, dump the client, and then let's do go build. And oh, so we need a package import here. So go build and let's run our client. And there we go. And as you can see, uh, that's JSON encoded data. There's comma between it now. And it says ID, the field, the record, um, the request ID. This is a request type which we haven't been changing. The data and, but notice size shows up as a field name. So this is very different than what we had before. So we're successfully creating a JSON document and now we can send it. Of course, we do not have a server that's listening. So I'm not printing out the error that we are seeing and that's okay because if we have an error, I don't try to close that document. I sort of don't care right now. I just care that oh, this seems to be working. Once we have a server, we'll see that make sure that our client is actually sending this data to that server. And of course, on the server side, we'll decode it. So this is all for the client side and we don't want the noise. So I'll again, remove that That's just a testing. And if we compile and run again, build and run our client, it's quiet because it's trying to send. Um, of course it's failing. Okay. So that's about it. I hope this makes sense. Peace, post question, concerns, criticisms, suggestions, all that sort of stuff. Let me know. Take care. See you. Um, the code is available in GitHub.